with my friends, Higher Orbits and Unify Agency and many others around the country. We are delighted to welcome back my good friend, Dr. Ryan Kobrick, who has applied to be an astronaut and uh, I will be cheering him on so that one day that is a reality. So without further ado, let's give a big warm virtual welcome to Dr. Ryan Kobrick. Glad to have you back. Thanks, I'm happy to be back and hello everybody. Uh, yeah, I've applied a few times. I was trying to count them up. And if you include, I'm a dual citizen, so I'm from Canada, I'm a Canadian American. Um, if you include both NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, it's seven times. So hopefully this is lucky seven. And speaking of lucky seven, we'll, we'll talk about seven in just a moment here. Um, it's been really uh, a cool journey. It takes a lot of work. A lot of the things that, um, a lot of things I do, I'm passionate about human spaceflight. So that's what um, connects me to these opportunities. Um, yes, one day when I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. Um, but I'm not doing these things just so I can kind of put it on a resume to say, look at all the things I've done. It's more like, oh, these are really cool things. I want to do them. And yes, they do help with, if you will, training for that, that ultimate job that everyone would, of course, want. And I guess the quick question is like, for everyone here, um, maybe just like raise your hand or something. If you want to be an astronaut one day when you grow up, maybe you can just like raise your hand or wave. Who wants to be an astronaut or a cosmonaut or a taikonaut or any kind of knot, space knot, <laughs> astronaut, <laughs> an astro astronaut? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, today's kind of a cool anniversary that was mentioned. And uh, that's actually something that is, let me share my screen. Uh, the last time we talked, I was chatting about spacesuits and why you need a spacesuit and how it keeps you alive in space. So today, um, I'm kind of uh, changing the topic a little bit, but it's still human spaceflight. And we're going to talk about analog research and kind of Mars simulations. And I know you guys have had a few people already talk to you about them. Um, so I want to share my experience, like uh, something that I went through. Actually, Artemis was part of our team that helped uh, pull us pull off one of the longest um, uh, remote simulations. We were on Devon Island up in the Arctic, and I'm going to share some photos with you. So let me share my screen. Here's our spacesuit stuff that we talked about. And let me get to slide 25 of my photos here. So can everyone see my slide uh, here, spacesuit up part D? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of uh, little pop-ups here. Um, let me just shift this. And then that way, Jen, if there's a question, you can kind of wave at me. I will see it kind of pop up in the menu bar, but I'm trying to make sure that I can actually see what I'm looking at. Okay. Yeah, no worries. And I will cool. interrupt you when there are questions. So guys, if you if we comes to a slide and you have a question, please yeah. message me in the chat and then I can quickly find you and you can ask. Okay. Sounds awesome. Yeah, it's like uh there's like so many cool options for the for these different um ways of engaging. And then you're like you you click full screen on something, you're like, oh, that's not quite what I thought it would look like. But I do I will see if the chat lights up and I can. And I'll look to Janet as well. So here we go, part two, but before that, um, here we go. Ta-da, it's the US's National Astronaut Day. So what does that mean? Well, the first American, the first astronaut, because remember the first human launched in space was actually a cosmonaut. That was Yuri Gagarin on April 12th, 1961. Well, soon after May 5th, that's today, 1961 was the first American in space on, um, we see Alan Shepard here in all the photos because he was that first American. So there's Freedom 7, the capsule that was on top of the rocket here. Um, and so his flight, though, um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, that he went on a suborbital flight. And so he actually only spent 15 minutes in space. So suborbital is the same as if you took a ball and threw it up in the air, but you threw it really high with a rocket strapped to it. And it came, went all the way up and then all the way down. That's what suborbital is. An orbital flight is when you actually make a whole lap around the planet. So you have enough speed and energy to do that. So this was the first test flight um, of the Mercury program. Really, the Mercury program was designed to see if humans could survive in space, if they could orbit the Earth, and if they could recover the person and the capsule safely. So those were the objectives of the whole program. 
And so this was the first step uh, for the US going into space. So pretty exciting. Um, so his rocket there, um, uh, it's a Redstone rocket. So this was the, the Mercury Redstone 3 flight because the first two flights were without humans. Actually, there were some monkeys on board. Um, so first US creatures in space were not humans. Um, so there's Alan Shepard. And so the way that we're gonna link this to today's talk is that the astronauts, here they are, the Mercury 7, actually did a lot of training to help prepare them for going into space. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is analog research and how that's used to prepare people to go to Mars. Um, so before I start, I did see a little, the chat bubble pop up. I'm not sure if there's anything I need to stop for here. Uh, the question is from Jesse is Redstone. What is oh, Redstone? Okay. So redstone is not the Minecraft redstone. Redstone is actually the rockets. Let me back up a second here. We were talking about Minecraft before we started recording here. Um, so there's the rocket. It's the redstone rocket. Um, so the redstone rocket was a smaller rocket. It was only used for two of the human space flights for the Mercury program. And after that, they used the Atlas rocket, which is used to go orbital because it was a lot bigger, a lot more power. Um, and so there were only two. Um, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and then the first orbital flight was of John Glenn, um, which was a, almost a year later on the Atlas. Okay, so I so yeah, everything is Minecraft, I know. So um, yeah, maybe you guys can make a redstone redstone rocket in Minecraft um, as a little project here. Um, so let's talk about space analog. So as you saw in my background when we started, you saw part of this photo, and you saw this last time. Um, so this is actually up in the Arctic on Devon Island. So first, the big question is, what are you talking about? What is a space analog? Um, sorry, I got to move my toolbar around just so I can see my own text. Um, so overall, it's something that uh, basically a lot of people like to nickname this fake Mars. Like, how do you simulate Mars? How do you prepare astronauts? And so you have to have some of these things uh, very similar to make sure that it's actually a good place to go to study being on Mars. So that could be the environment, um, meaning that you're, you're doing similar field work, which is mostly going to be geology, but there is biology because we're searching for life on Mars. That's the big question is, was there life on Mars? I mean, you could say, what is there still life on Mars? But likely it would have been more of the ancient life of what may or may not have been there. The other is analog mission or tasks. So that's where you actually simulate the mission or you can actually get data like serendipitous data, which is, you know, people are living on a submarine and they're isolated and they're dependent on their life support to make sure everything works. It's just like being on a spacecraft. And even though they're not there to simulate Mars, we can collect data uh, about how the crew got along. And right now, this pandemic is actually kind of like a serendipitous um, and space analog, because uh, we're kind of living in different levels of isolation and remoteness, and we're using technology, obviously, to connect. Um, but imagine if we were on Mars, it would take uh, 10 to 20, excuse me, 10 to 20 minutes for the signal just to reach one way. So it might be 20 minutes of a round trip signal just to say, hi, Minecraft, right? And then so that would be a really slow conversation. It'd be frustrating. The best idea might be maybe just sending a video and then getting a video reply. And, you know, you're checking your messages later on. Um, so that's a very, it's very difficult as you are all experiencing different, I guess you could say levels of difficulty right now. Um, I see a bunch of chat things. Do I need to, is there anything to, let's see, look at the camera, who, me or someone else? Me? Hi, I'm looking at a camera now. How about that? I don't know. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, I'll, I'll look at the camera, but I, I want to make sure I give you guys the right, you know, clear information. So I'm looking at my, my screen too. Um, I'll do my best. Um, so here's one of those Mars analogs. So what's a Mars analog? It's when you match as many variables as possible to make it Mars-like. So here's the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, this is a location that I've been to uh, five times, six times, five times. Um, it's, it's very Mars-like, like look at the picture here. It's like red hills and you can see the different layers so you can learn about the history of the terrain. Um, it's uh, ancient lake bed in Utah. So uh, it has a lot of extreme life that is still kind of living there. Um, so we're looking for these extremophiles that live in these extreme environments. Um, they have something, if you wanna go into the, the more sciencey term of it, it's 
uh, of that, it's halophilic because it's salt loving. So they love salt and they can survive in salt. And when you think about how, what salt can do to like little bugs, it's not good, right? It sucks the moisture and the water right out of their body. Um, and so the life that can live in this extreme environment, it's pretty cool to, to learn about them. How do they survive there? Or how do they live there? So um, trying to click here, click, click, click. There we go. So there's a lot of advantages and I'm only gonna show you a few slides by the way with text, like all this text. And I'm gonna show you a lot of photos and say some stories, um, but it's cheaper. Obviously it's cheaper to train here. You can train in your backyard. It'd be cheaper than you know blasting someone off to um, the moon to train them for Mars or to any of those things. So there's a lot of work we can do here on earth. Um, it's a way of testing technology. So you can see on the picture here, Nemo 13, that's actually where they train Aquarius Reef Base. It's off the coast of Key Largo in Florida. And they go underwater and they train astronauts on how to do mission operations. Uh, you can train your crew. So you can actually, you could try different combinations. Like does person one and person two and person three, do they work well as a, a crew or do we need person three, person one and person seven? And so you can actually change you know, what the crew composition looks like and find who would be the best for the mission. Um, and then also you can test all your ideas and protocols. Um, and the last one there is really important. It's like, if you can remember what kind of one thing from this, uh, it's the comparative planetology. That sounds like a, a bunch of big words, but it's really just, you're comparing planets, right? So you're looking at the things here on earth that are similar to the moon or similar to Mars. So we're looking at how um, one major feature is a volcano, right? Or uh, impact crater. And that's why we went to Devon Island um, in Canada is because it's an impact crater. Um, there's volcanoes on the moon. Next time you look up at the moon, look at those dark patches. Those are actually ancient volcanic lava flows. So, and they were called the mare because that means seas because they look like these big seas from down here on earth, just dark regions. So- Can you spell that word? Yeah. Uh, yeah, which one, Mare or? Uh -huh, Mare, how do you spell so, that? M-A-R-E. M-A-R-E. And then plural of Maria, so M-A-R-I-A. -A. Um, so if you th look at a map of the moon, you'll see all the Mare. So you'll see like, you know, each of those seas has a name, like um, uh, Sea of Tranquility is the English version, but I don't know if it's, I'm gonna butcher it, Tranquilis Mare um, is, the, is mare. the actual. Name. The word in Latin is mare. Yeah. Uh, it's not mare, no mari, mare. It's a Latin word and it simply means sea. And this yeah. is the way it's pronounced, mare. Yeah. I have a Canadian accent, so that's what I was saying, actually. <laughs> so mar mare. <laughs> I can roll my tongue a little, right? I don't know. It's Cinco de Mayo, so okay. That's um, right. Yeah, so let's move on. Um, so there you got an idea. Here's um, actually with on the left is actually uh, my students uh, in Greece. We do a study abroad program every summer and we actually do a simulated moonwalk. We actually put weights on extra weights around their waist, extra weights around their tank, um, which simulates the large backpack. The, this was called the portable life support system, but now it's called the primary life support system because before it was actually, uh, they attached them by hoses during Apollo, but now that's actually integrated into the spacesuit. Uh, on the space shuttle upgraded versions, which are the space station version. Um, so my, my students get to learn what it feels like to like actually walk on the moon. It's pretty fun to do. Um, here's some more pictures of them moonwalking, um, just to show you like um, without putting weights on their backpack, like on the tank, they're actually pitched all the way over and putting some weights on the tank actually helps them walk more upright. Um, but the backpack was really heavy on the moon. Um, and because of that, the astronauts were falling all over the place. So um, that was a whole nother thing. So here's all, here's some pictures. These are, I have a lot of like, you know, personal pictures. This is me um, on my multiple missions. So I mentioned I was on six different Mars simulations. Uh, the longest one was four months in the Arctic. And I'll show you some more photos of that. And so overall, I went on, um, over 232 hours of being on simulated EVAs. So, um, hey, you've got a question yeah. from uh, yeah. Thomas Swinney. Uh, let me find you, my sure. sweet. Uh, go ahead and ask your question, hon. 
um, during the analog missions, uh, how does the entire crew live at the site for the required time period? Or like, do they stay somewhere else? Great question. Um, I'm gonna show you guys some photos of the habitat. And uh, for the simulations, the crew is living in basically what people call a tuna can in the desert. Um, it's the only structure that's there. They're all alone um, usually. So for the different types of locations, you take different transportation. For the one in Utah, you can just rent a car and drive kind of into the desert because it's people know where it is. For the F Mars for this one that I'm gonna talk about in the Arctic, you actually have to fly in. Uh, when we arrived, we actually had to land on skis on the airplane um, and then take snowmobiles in the airplane out of the airplane to then to bring the gear to the station, which was about a kilometer away from the landing strip. Um, and then later, as the snow melted away, we were able to, excuse me, use ATVs to haul gear back and forth. Um, but you're all alone. Um, it's it's very it's we we um, do a lot of training. We figure out all the risks and figure out what to do if something goes wrong. Um, so it's a, a very um, I guess you could say we've spent a lot of time preparing for these type of missions. It's not like just everyone show up and you know play astronaut. We're actually preparing to do a lot of field research. So I'll show you a lot more photos. I've got during like that, a, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, during that four months, did you feel like I just want to go home? I want to be around <laughs> people. I mean, did you have those feelings or did you kind of settle into, did you just set your mind, this is what I'm here to do, I'm learning so much. I mean, was there a blend yeah. of that? Yeah, um, there's a little bit of all of that, of course, um, to different levels. Uh, the desire or the need to go home um, wasn't, I didn't have it like I need to get out of here, but I did have the feeling of like, I could use more updates from friends, like how's it going? Um, so more connection to other things happening in the world would have been helpful. Um, this was in 2007, so this is like, you know, before uh, the beginnings of Facebook, but not really, and you couldn't really use Facebook because it's not real time anyway. Um, you had, we had 20 minute delays between our conversations, our emails even, and also we didn't have very much uh, bandwidth, so it was really hard to send data. So even sending a video message back and forth was difficult. The ones that I uploaded, um, I actually made like a, a video log, so if you guys want to see some videos of this. Um, I think I have like 15 or 20 videos during the mission. And um, even getting those up line, I had to down sample them to like minimum resolution to upload them to YouTube. So that was, you know, it's pretty difficult. Um, and so halfway through, we were actually uh, working really hard. Um, so you can see on the left there, I'm holding this giant drill. That was our main tool. That was like a, our power rock hammer drill. Um, we use that for a lot of our sampling for both rocks and for looking for microbes, so both geology and biology. And um, we, as the things were heating up, the top layer in the Arctic, or it's not necessarily the top layer, but in winter it is because it's, it's the, that's where it's located. It's called the permafrost. And so that's where the ground is completely frozen. So any water content in the ground is frozen. And as the summer warms up in the Arctic, that permafrost layer actually starts to go down, down, down into the soil. Um, as the water is starting to move, melt and move away. And so for all of our investigations, we were doing it on the permafrost layer, how deep it is, is there microorganisms in it? Um, and so in the middle of the mission, while that transition was happening, we were actually going out on two EVAs per day um, and it was completely exhausting. The crew was just wiped out and everyone was kind of grumpy. Um, and so that was a very hard part of the mission. And so that was, that, that was also corresponded with the middle of the mission, right? Two months out of the four months. And so after we got through that really hard period, um, the crew actually was able to focus more on, okay, we've got another month and a half to go. Um, we need to like wrap up our data collection and doing some of the analysis because we know we can't bring all these samples home. So we need to be able to do things now. Um, and so we were a lot more motivated, but. I think that's the biggest difference between um, one of these space analogs and what we're experiencing now is that we knew how long our mission was. Um, right now, we don't know how long our, our space family mission at home is going to be. And that's really what makes it hard. And um, it's, you know, if we had that, some people are like, well, at the end of the month, they're going to lift the state ban on so-and-so. 
well, that's like a micro kind of goal or whatever that you can look forward to. Um, but really it's better to just try to figure out what routine works best for you and not worry about those kind of things because anything can really happen, right? Um, there's, you know, a second wave of people might be sick or um, mutations. And I don't want to like scare everyone all of a sudden, but I just want to, you know, acknowledge how hard it is for everyone to, that they might, and I know how hard it is for what everyone's going through right now. Um, I've got two little kids at home and a dog. Um, and so we're doing everything we can as well to um, find the right balance. And so uh, yesterday was fun. Actually, let me go to my gallery view if I can. I can kind of do gallery view. Um, it's kind of a pop up here for me. How many people, so I can see everyone now instead of my screen. Um, how many people celebrated Star Wars Day yesterday for May the 4th? May the 4th be with you. I see yes. a bunch of hands. All, all yes. right. And a bunch of, yeah, Aramis is very excited about it. Well, <laughs> not, only, not only is today Cinco de Mayo, US's American, astro, excuse me, National Astronaut Day. It's also my half birthday, but that, that's just, you know, another fun thing, but it's Cinco de Mayo. And so another Star Warsy thing is that it's also Revenge of the, of the Sith for May 5th. So I've got my Cinco de Mayo Revenge of the Sith t-shirt. Um, there you go. I got my uh, Darth Vader from my shirt that I bought in Mexico. All right. So um, I love it. But, yeah. So having fun with these things, like we have a calendar with like one, you know, the fun thing of the day. We there's lots of uh, uh, resources for parents, kids, whoever, adults to download to have these like little micro holidays. And we actually did that in the Arctic. We actually I made a list and I have it somewhere. It's an Excel file and it has the whole four months. And I just went online and this, like, again, this is before things were very organized on the internet um, and started writing down all the cool things I could find, like talk like a pirate day. I, I will never forget talk like a pirate day. That was a lot of fun. Um, and so those are, those are things that we can do together that can uh, give us activities. Um, it takes a little bit of the stress off, right? Cause you don't have to think what's our activity or what's our theme gonna be? Well, there's lots of them. There's, there's like five different things just today, so. I see a hand kind of waving. I feel like we should find out what that hand is before Lucas is like waving around there or he's doing his exercises while I talk, which is a good idea too. Um, is there a question over there before I move on? Yes, oh, I do have a the... question. Okay. And this is just a question that I think Artemis would really enjoy. And <laughs> that is, and that is, where would Europe be on Mars? Where would Europe be on Mars? Cool question. <laughs> I have no idea, Lucas, where <laughs> Europe would be on Mars. But basically, you know, if we want Europe to be on Mars, you know, some place that we call Europe, because that's what we're talking about, right? Um, then we actually would write a, a letter to the... Um, I think it's the executive committee of the International Astronomical Union. And thankfully, as far as I know, the president is a Dutch professor, a female, an astronomer whom I know well. And I've already talked to her that if I have an idea about a name, I can petition her, although I am not allowed to vote about this because I'm not part of this union. But she is. And she I had some cool ideas, she thought. So who knows, perhaps I can name some, some place, some nice highlands. Europe, that would be cool, right, Lucas? I think uh, Canada's gonna end up at the pole again though. But the, the poles are a good place to be because there could be concentrated uh, ice there, water ice or something underneath. So um, I'm gonna move ahead. I wanna show you some more photos of the Arctic. So here's, the, here's where we're living. The people were asking, where were you living? So this is the... We, we called the two-story tuna can the flat and it, the, its actual name was the flashline mars arctic research station flashlight flashline was a company that sponsored the original um i guess you could say construction and uh uh rollout of this location um but and, and it was kind of like f mars that's kind of the short for it, and everyone kind of just stuck with that so even though flashline wasn't involved for much longer um f mars there it is so this is what it looked like in May of 2007 when we arrived. Uh, you can see everything is frozen. 
Um, in the foreground, those are red sleds that would be pulled by the snowmobiles, which are not in this photo. And behind the hab from this angle is the impact crater. So it kind of like you can't tell, but it just drops off. And in the background there are the rolling hills of the impact crater. Um, so where is this place? So this is a, a map of Canada mostly. And you can see it's way up there at 75 degrees north on Devon Island. Um, Houghton impact crater is, the, is a 39 million year old impact crater. So it's just like an impact crater that you could study on any planetary body. Um, and because of it's an impact crater, that means that it's uh, something hit the earth extremely fast and hard and threw everything up in the air, but also shows the history of the planet because you get to see all the layers um, looking down into the earth's history. So that's why it's an important site to study. And people study it, not just in these simulations, but they actually go up there every summer to study it as well. So the closest city, if you look on the bottom left, you'll see a red dot that's resolute. So this is in Nunavut, the, it's the territory of Canada. Um, and so that's where you would, you would fly on a real uh, charter plane like a company into there. And then you would have to charter your own plane to get to the impact crater where you would land on skis. Um, so this is what it looked like before we went out on you can't just leave the habitat. You have to wear a spacesuit every time you leave the habitat. So here's our simulated spacesuits. Um, it's basically like putting on a full snowsuit with a fish pole on top of your head, and then a big backpack that has a couple uh, computer fans in the back to blow fresh air over your face. Not only is it important to have fresh air, um, but it actually helps defog the helmet as well, because otherwise it would just ice over. And I think if you remember back 50 photos ago, my first time in the uh, going in the field in the Arctic, my whole visor frosted over, which can be very dangerous if you can't see. So when we first got there, this is our first EVA. And as you can see, it's like, well, is this a Mars analog or is this a moon analog? And it actually felt more like the moon. Um, even though it wasn't a black sky, the sky was no color because it was like kind of hazy and overcast. Um, the snow was, it felt like we were walking through like lunar regolith. Um, and so it, it was almost moon-like at first, but we were very focused on getting things started that I guess we weren't really reflecting on how this was like the moon until later on. So it's kind of interesting to think about it that way. Um, you know, we're very in a very, very, very new place and we want to explore uh, very, you know, carefully. And so some of these things we're not quite reflecting on yet until after. So this is what it finally looked like. How, what temperature yeah. range did you guys yeah. experience there? So, um, so this is the, the fun part is that it was negative 40. And so you can pick whatever scale you want because that negative 40 is the same in Celsius as it is in Fahrenheit. Um, absolutely freezing. If you took your glove off, you could take your glove off for less than a minute before your hand would like actually really, really hurt. And you know, you'd have to like shake your arms out to get the blood flowing back to your fingertips. Um, so extreme environment um, for sure. And you're, you know, you're very isolated. You're all by yourself. Just, we had our crew of seven and that was it. So this is what it looked like when all the snow melted. Uh, very rocky Mars-like terrain. So that's great um, for the simulation. The only difference here is the blue sky. Um, we talked about what if we put on red, like um, a red filter, just like I learned about the beacon today of how you can color the beacon in Minecraft. You could put a filter over your face shield and change the, the simulation that way. But uh, it's not it's the safest thing to do when you're riding snowmobiles and ATVs. And, um, and uh, so that's not part of the simulation in this case. So here's me crawling out of the crater. That's actually right next to the habitat. So it's very rocky going down the slope. So we had to find a safe place to be able to drive in and out. In the very bottom, like if you look, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you guys see my mouse if I wave it around? Yeah. Okay, I think there's actually a laser pointer somewhere too, but that's okay. Um, so here's my mouse. Um, I don't know. I'm right along here where my mouse is. You can see there's like a street. That's a road, a common road. Because when you're doing science investigations, you don't want to just drive all over the place because then you'd be running over science all over the place, uh, especially if you're searching for life. So you have to be very careful about your paths that you take um, and try to repeat them as much as possible. And so we had very planned routes to get to our science investigation sites. Now, so are all one. of those yeah. things pre-planned and those roads pre-made? Yeah. Are you having to make any of those things while you're there? So a lot of them, um, 
there are some common maps that have been shared by researchers about like this is the the road path that everyone has kind of agreed upon. Um, so uh, there's a few that are kind of like the main highways, and they're they're not like roads. They're not like someone went out there and made roads. They're just places where you can actually see tracks from use. And so it's kind of like a, a common agreed upon pathway. Um, it's also a common agreed upon safe pathway because as the permafrost melts, it actually makes uh, very muddy sections um, depending on where you are in the terrain, which can actually be very dangerous. Um, we had one kind of fun side story, not fun for the person that it happened to, but someone actually got stuck in the mud. Uh, a little bit scary, a little bit funny. Um, and they had to pull them out of the mud and then they had to go back and pull their boot out of the mud by laying planks down on the ground so that they could like put their body weight distributed to pull it out because it was actually that dangerous. It was like, like they weren't just, it wasn't just like, oh, my foot stuck. It's like, oh, oh boy, what are we, you know, they had to solve a major problem to get the person out of the mud. So I can't wow. share more details than that because the person might be upset if they, <laughs> if more gets out. But uh, there are real hazards out there as well. Um, so here's just some photos of us drilling. Uh, one thing to add to the people who are familiar with like uh, biological type sciences is that you can't just drill into the ground and take microbes. You need to use a drill that's sterilized, meaning that's clean, because then you just would be introducing your own microbes into the ground. So to actually do this, to make it real biology, we actually had to dip that tip that, that I'm holding in the top left corner of the drill bit uh, into a bottle of isopropanol and set it on fire while wearing these simulated spacesuits, these bulky gloves and everything else. So as you can imagine, that was not an easy thing to do, but it would clean the drill bit and then we would take the samples for, for biology. Luckily for geology, we didn't have to do that. We had a little bit more geology than biology, but things to think about when we um, are um, exploring and taking samples in another world is that we don't wanna contaminate that planet with our germs while we're trying to find out about their germs, if you will. So here's another For those photo. Of you yep. who are wondering what isopropyl, how do you say that? I never can say it right, but it's basically alcohol. Like, you yeah. know what your mom yeah. puts on like a scrape. How do you say that yeah. word? I, I'm looking at it and I go, isopropyl? Is that how you say that word? <laughs> you know, now that you've said it two or three times, I'm going to say it wrong. <laughs> I'm from Tennessee. It's like, I've been up since 2.30 doing work. Yeah. So it's like, I don't, I, I don't claim to like be able to pronounce anything, but. I'm going to say it now. It's probably going to be wrong. That was isopro isopropanol. <laughs> so they say that, don't even say that 10 times fast. Just say it like once fast. Isopropanol. I think something yeah. like that. Yeah. Basically yeah. alcohol that your mom probably has put yeah. on a scrape or two in your life. I think it was. I'm also reading Jesse's spelling. So it's between both of us, babe. Okay. All right, moving on. Yeah, so yeah, so it's just a way that you need to clean, sterilize, clean things. Um, sometimes people will do this even for um, a splinter that you would, you know, you take your tweezers and you would um, use, a, excuse me, use like a, a lighter or something to heat them up and clean them. And then you wait for it to cool down, obviously, but it keeps them so that you're not gonna infect your wound when you like take that little splinter out. Um, so it's kind of like a little survival tip, you know, you got to think about how to keep um, things clean. Um, so, oh, yeah, so this is just one last photo of, um, of FMARS and the crater is uh, behind me. Um, so this is just like, you know, one last little space selfie, I guess you could say, uh, wearing the simulated spacesuit. Um, just to point out a few things under my right arm, so on your left side is my radio is clipped to my belt, which runs up the middle here into my ear and it's actually taped with duct tape to my ear. Um, that's something that, you know, all, all the simulation, NAR simulations around the world are working on is how to make a, uh, you know, high fidelity spacesuit that doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, and so let's take a look at some more photos. Here's the, my hey, last photo. On the gloves yeah. that you were using, because, yeah. you know, um, I've told the kids before, and just as a reminder, that in space, yeah. astronauts actually will lose their their fingernails and stuff. It's like because of that pressure. After months of work going out and doing these EVAs and stuff in those gloves, yeah. did you feel like your hands had had a workout by the time you're trying to really manipulate things inside? I mean, we're used to just having dexterity with our hands, but yeah. did you find it yeah. interesting or what was that? Yeah, like? so... Um, being a uh, Canadian and all growing up wearing gloves every time I left the house um, for, you know, eight months of the year, 
uh, I was definitely used to gloves. I play hockey. I still play hockey every week. Um, uh, I'm just used to, I'm just used to gloves. Um, even I, I actually sailed competitively for over a decade and I even wear sailing gloves for that. So I feel like for me, it's like part of my, it's like wearing a t-shirt. It's like, you know, wearing sunglasses. It just, it kind of feels natural. So for me, it was like, yes, they're, they're hard to move and they're bulky. Um, these, so th these are ski gloves. This is me trying to zoom in on it. Um, and you can see there's like duct tape on various fingers. Um, there's actually on, not on this hand, but I think on the other hand, which I don't know if it'll show up. Um, I actually duct taped like, um, basically, um, uh, pen, um, to my, to actually, I think that's what's on my thumbs. I duct taped a zip tie, the fat part of the zip tie pointing outwards so that I would have a little tip so I could push buttons like on my GPS because it got really hard to push buttons with those gloves because you don't feel it. And future gloves may or may not have the ability to work with touchscreens um, on EVA. They definitely will work with touchscreens inside the vehicle. We talked about this last time, IVA and EVA, where IVA is inside the vehicle, intravehicular activity, where the astronauts wear a special spacesuit for launch and reentry. Um, those ones will definitely be touchscreen because they're working with touchscreens for their flight controls. But when you're out in the field, having a touchscreen type glove is, is another big step in technology. We may or may not want touchscreen things out in the field, especially if we have like uh, intense sharp um, sun angles and sharp lunar dust that might scratch things. Um, we might want to have things that actually have push buttons that we can somehow feel, if you will, through the glove. So yeah, you, lo you lose a bunch of that. Um, your fingers, your hands get tired if you're doing a lot of work, but it's just like, um, it's also a padding as well. And the big difference between these and like the training in the neutral buoyancy lab with the, the current gloves is that those, those are actually not form fitting to your hands. They're, they're very close fitting, um, but your hands are moving in them. Your hands are getting really sweaty. Um, they're fighting against pressure. And so they're really working against um, different issues. And so the fingernails end up rubbing all the time while you're moving your hands, like bending your hands and they rub, 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 where these gloves are soft. So they're kind of moving with you. And so that's important too, is that um, your gloves are one of your most important parts of your spacesuit because they're what interact with the, with the world around you. It's, if you're in microgravity, it's what's, you know, what you use to move. You don't have, you don't need legs in microgravity, you're floating. You just need your arms and your hands. So your, your gloves are extremely important. And then your helmet, your visor, your ability to see um, is kind of the next important thing. Like you need to be able to see what you're working on. Um, so there's that half fishbowl here. All right, so we've got, I've got like, um, I got a couple more slides actually of Utah that I'll share. So this is the last photo that I took of FMARS. This is in the airplane. Um, the Twin Otter is the type of airplane. So it's landing actually on wheels because you can see it's all dry. The runway is not shown here, but look, you can see the road going to the left away from the HAB. And then we would go all the way around and down the hill there because the HAB is located on that rocky part of the impact crater. So you can't really go down there. Um, and so there's our like campus, if you will, all alone. And the uh, picture on the right is um, actually of our first sunset in four months, because when you're in the Arctic in the summer, it actually, the sun doesn't set. It just goes around and around and around. Um, but angles become like, you know, low light angles, kind of like that, like it's almost sunset because it's diffracting through the atmosphere. Um, but it took four months for us to see the sunset. Um, so it's pretty kind of, it, it is pretty, and it's pretty wild to think about. So the way we dealt, we had our mission work was that we um, would put boards up in the windows at like, I don't know, 7 p.m., 7.30. So we had our simulated nighttime to help us. Otherwise, our bodies wouldn't know when to sleep. Um, it's called your circadian rhythm. And your brain just, when it has sunlight and like, all this red light, blue light, pour, mostly blue light pouring into you. Um, you just, your body thinks it needs to be awake. And so we had to help make sure that our bodies uh, knew when it was time to like, hey, it's time to shut down and rest. So it's very important. Um, okay, so this is fun. This is uh, my friends that I made um, in Resolute. This is, uh, you know, before and after. So the puppies got really big. So uh, we talked about puppies before we started chatting today. Um, so wow. these are a couple, couple huskies. They live outside every, like very rarely do they let them inside to like warm up. But for the most part, they live out in the, not the wild. I mean, they're with the people, 
but they these guys uh, live outside, so they're very cute. Um, and I think their mom was. I have other photos with you know playing with their mom as well. Um, and yeah, I, we all wanted to just take them home. They're adorable. <laughs> um, so let's see what else we got. I got a couple. I think I've got some photos now of Utah, which is a little bit closer to home in the U.S. So uh, I like to say Utah is Mars. I mean, look at this place. I mean, you just don't look at the blue sky, but <laughs> this place is very, very Mars-like. So uh, I want to show you some things that we did there. Some photos. Um, this is Phobos Peak. This is one of my favorite places to go on one of these simulated uh, space walks, simulated Mars walk. Um, it's, you have to kind of, you have to walk there and then you have to kind of scramble up a rocky hill on the right. You can't actually go up the left. That's a steep drop off uh, and it's sandy and you would just, you wouldn't be able to get a grip. So you make your way up the right side. And if you look where my mouse is in the distance, you'll see these little white dots. That's actually the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, so that's how far away we were from them. And so anyway, this is like one of my coolest favorite spots to go to when I go to um, Utah. And so what you're looking at is the photo. I'm on the right and my colleague, Dr. Sarah Jane Pelzom is on the right. I'm on the left sitting down and we're actually fixing my boots. My boots completely fell apart on this EVA. Um, the soles ripped right off the bottoms. These are the same boots I wore 10 years before this photo in the Arctic. And then they just kind of rotted away as I traveled around because I wasn't using them that often. So it's really important to have the right boots and the right footwear and right equipment. And so I like to say that I lost my soul on Phobos Peak, but I actually lost both of them. Um, and so equipment's very important. Um, so here's a, this is us inside the habitat. We were actually testing the spacesuits. And if you remember my spacesuit talk, we talked about range of motion, how much you can actually move your body around in these suits. Um, that's really important for astronauts. And so we were doing some tests inside the science dome of that. So that's myself on the right with the blue shirt. Uh, Zach in the middle is our test subject and Dr. Sarah Jane Pell on the right. So here's one of my photos of uh, the crew. Um, the three of us were out in the field. Um, this, is, this place is a, a wild place. It's like these goblin looking uh, structures. There's actually a place called Goblin Valley that's near By the way, Ryan, you should yep. tell them that this is the bottom of a sea and if you look really careful at this 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 geological landscape you can imagine that this is you know was covered with water and this is really the bottom of a lake or a sea and it doesn't look like a normal field or a normal mountain if you yeah. look at it i think you can imagine that this was not a normal mountain or a normal highland or whatever yeah i think this is candor chasm i think is the name of the area and um, it's very, it's not the easiest place to get into because you actually have to kind of, you have to hike in and scramble downwards. And there's this one spot where it's like, is it even safe to move on? Um, and it was a spot that we've done lots of different times in the past. Um, and we actually found kind of a modified version route of it where we were safely going into it. So it's actually quite difficult to get to that region. And then once you get to this kind of area, it's just like, it's breathtaking. So the astronaut or simulated uh, analog astronaut on the right there uh, is taking a photo kind of into the valley that's below there as well. So there's a limit to of how far um, where we can go and because of the suits and because of a safe distance to make sure we can walk back. We don't, you know, you can't go too far, but it's a pretty wild looking location. Um, okay, I have a couple more photos to share. Uh, so also, you know, I mentioned my kids uh, at the time I only had my son um, and he still loves Disney cars. He hasn't really, you know, he's more into Minecraft and uh, Lego and everything else now. But um, so I brought Lightning McQueen to Mars. And so that was fun for him. And I took this photo. Um, what I'm wearing there, that glove is actually a, um, an actual, what's called a TMG, a thermal micrometeorite garment. It's what they wear on top of the pressurized spacesuit. Uh, and I was testing these for a company called Final Frontier Design. Um, so they're very bulky. They added a couple extra layers to simulate the pressure. So I was working pretty hard with those gloves. Um, and so it's important that we bring our kind of our personal lives as well um, as a, an important part of these Mars simulations and the community outreach and everything else. Um, and finally, let's see, here's a, 
Uh, on the left there is two of my crewmates, Melissa and Kathy. Um, they're, yes, we're kind of posing for a photo, but I think it's important because it shows kind of the next step of this kind of dreams to reality, where on the right, we see these older renderings created by Pat Rawlings um, of kind of the vision of doing exploration on Mars. Now we have this ne next level of, of fidelity of reality of the simulated analog astronauts um, looking at field work. And maybe the next step will actually be, you know, humans to the moon or humans to Mars, uh, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, we'll we should talk about that too. So that's, that, that's it in terms of my slides. Here's my like social media things if you're interested in seeing things I post. Um, but um, let me stop screen sharing. And I don't know, how many of you uh, are aware of or heard about the lunar lander announcements that just happened um, just a few days ago? That was really exciting. Um, there's a lot more companies actually than I thought were uh, gonna be involved in it. I thought it would just be like one group of one kind of team, but they picked three teams. Um, and so these three teams are going to be developing the lunar, lunar landing um, systems that are going to bring humans back to the moon or to the next phase of the moon or however you wanna phrase it. Uh, the first woman on the moon, the next man on the moon, I personally, I just care about humans on the moon. So, you, you know, that's what's really important to me. Um, I don't really think that we need to spend time. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge the history of things and how we want to make sure it's inclusive of everyone on the moon. But that's why humans to the moon is kind of a more important kind of way that I like to think about it. Well, I know we have some questions. And again, All your right. experience alone is, I mean, for you to have had so many months and hours and all these kinds of things, you're fully prepared for what that could be like in space. Uh, yeah. So Tapa Swinney, you had a couple of really great questions and then raise your hand and I'll come around, but I know I saw those things in the chat. So go ahead and ask a few of the questions you had and then Ju uh, Jesse, and I think Judah, you may have had one as well. You may have to help me unmute you there, my trigger button's not working. There you go. Oh. All right, we'll come back to you because it's not unmuting there. You may have stepped away. So Jesse, you had some questions about animals or something. <laughs> I actually have two questions. Okay. My first one is, did he ever have any encounters with animals when he went to Utah? So um, space cows. <laughs> but that was like a decade ago. There were a couple of roaming cows and evidence of cows left on the ground. Um, and then I think there was um, a cougar in the area. We never saw it, but we saw footprints. Um, very rarely you'll see a bird. Um, and uh, there, the last mission, there was locals involved with the mission and their dogs were there. And that kind of interfered actually a little bit with the simulation because they would be barking and be like, what? There's no barking dogs on Mars. <laughs> and so it would be kind of frustrating that that interfered with um, something because we were all professional researchers that had spent a lot of time and money to be there. Um, so it was unfortunate that that happened. But um, it, to add to that for the Arctic, um, we only saw, I think, one bird fly by in four months. And the only other life we saw was like lichen, which is just basically rock mold um, growing on the rocks. And um, the one major difference though, between the those locations and the way you do your simulation is that there could be polar bears in the Arctic. And so you have to prepare for polar bears. And so we had a polar bear monitor and the polar bear monitor would actually wear as much gear as the other people on the simulated um, EVA because they'd have a giant backpack full of safety gear They'd have to carry around a shotgun. They'd be wearing thick ski goggles, a hat, like all your ski gear. Cause like I mentioned, it was, you know, negative 40 when we were started. Um, so they're wearing as much equipment as the simulated crew, um, which in a way helps because they don't feel like they're just, you know, breathing the fresh air and running around and having a day off. They're working twice as hard to stay out of the way and out of sight because we don't want the, um, we don't want the simulated kind of astronauts just having someone standing there watching them, right? Because that's like, why are you just standing there? So usually they would go a little bit away where they could see the terrain, like up on a hill, kind of a, a lookout, if you will, because polar bears are very dangerous. They 
are one of the only animals on the planet that actively hunt humans. Um, we were never hunted. And the closest we came to them was seeing footprints. Uh, luckily, the only polar bears we saw were ones stuffed in the airport. I mean, I would <laughs> love to see polar bears in their native habitat in the wild where I'm just watching, you know, nowhere, nowhere intervening. Um, I think that'd be pretty cool. Awesome. All right, uh, Tapa Swinney, can you uh, help me unmute your microphone, my dear? You have a couple of great questions. I'm just going to ask him for her. She asked, does wearing the suit for so long dull the senses, like the touch or smell or hearing? Did it dull your senses at all or did it heighten them? So um, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I don't think it dulled them at all. And we were out in the field maybe six, four to six hours total each time we went out in the field. And that's every day or every other day. Um, so it's really not a lot of time compared to the rest of your time inside the habitat. Um, I would say that it, in a way, it didn't it heighten our senses, but at the end of the mission, when we're, we could actually go outside and just be, well, I, I, I want to say in our t-shirt, but we weren't, when we were in the Arctic, we weren't just in our t-shirt, even in the end of August, because um, it's maybe 10 Celsius by the, at the on the warmest days. Um, but just like that, like sensation of like the wind, fresh, cool air, and like, you know, your goosebumps, like the, your sensitivity is a little bit heightened because you're more aware of it. You're, it's, you're more attached to it, I guess. Um, so that was a pretty cool sensation. I know that um, after a year in space, one of the first things Mark Kelly really wanted to do was to jump in a swimming pool because you don't shower and you don't bathe in space. You use a sponge and you, you know, you wash yourself clean or you put no rinse shampoo in your hair and use the towel to like wash your face. Um, so jumping into water, like an overwhelming um, sensation of like, this is something that only we can do here on our own planet. And I think that's why another major thing about exploration, going to the moon, going to Mars, is the more we learn about like things that keep us alive in these extreme environments um, will help us here on earth. So the more we learn about how to filter water, how to um, provide oxygen, like clean air and buildings and all those things, that, that helps us here on earth as well. And, um, you know, I watch a lot of science fiction. I haven't, I'll, I've been very busy this last month with the end of my um, semester because I work at the university. Um, but hopefully I get to watch a little bit more stuff now, but who knows, <laughs> but I love sci-fi. And most of the time, and even in sci-fi, you know, um, they talk about how um, people on earth are so lucky that just, you know, be able to walk outside and there you have air and you're, you know, you can, you can survive. And so it's our responsibility to take care of this planet. So that way, you know, we can enjoy it. And then future generations can also enjoy it. So very true. You said you have a second question, Jesse. So what's your second question? What vehicle did you use in the Arctic that didn't freeze the engine over? Yeah, so we used, uh, for the first two months, we used snowmobiles. And then for the second two months, we used ATVs when the snow went away. So we flew in with the snowmobiles inside of the airplane, the Twin Otter, landed on skis, as I mentioned, unloaded them. And then we actually had to have a second flight come in with more snowmobiles um, and more fuel. We had to have uh, basically jet airline fuel brought in so we could use it with our generator um, and our supplies. And we only had like a resupply mission, if you will, uh, roughly once a month where we would have extra supplies brought to us, which was very, uh, which is really cool and something that you can do for space station, at least in the future, but not really for Mars um, because it would take six to eight months for stuff to go from Earth to Mars. So unless you're doing a really long mission on Mars and you're like, I really need some popcorn in half a year from now, <laughs> then, you know, it's not the, not quite the same, but there were a few things and that's where Artemis and the mission support team really helped out was like, you know, what are, you know, one or two little things that you miss? Like, so peanut butter was obviously oh. a big one. Yeah. Um, and you know, also some of the equipment broke, the autoclave yeah. broke. And I remember <laughs> yeah. scrambling around on earth, you know, not in the Arctic, while being in the Netherlands, phoning to, uh, to California to get you a pressure cooker and then, you know, pushing it from California 
by mail all the way to Iqaluit, which is, if you look on the map in Canada, that's still a long way from Nunavut, from Resolute yeah. Bay. And then, you know, begging the guys that would fly planes, oh, do you really not have a little space for this pressure cooker? So it can be sent there, you know, yeah. you know, begging, 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 daily phoning. So getting it to Resolute Bay, but then it still wasn't with, with Ryan and his, his colleagues. And yeah. then, you know, getting it on the twin altar and to be hand delivered to uh, their place, things like that. It, uh, it was uh, interesting. What you didn't tell them is that you went and lived on Mars time. Tell them about right. that. Yeah, so um, how many of you know how long a Martian day is on average because Oh, I think Janet knows. Anyone else know? Any guesses? You could put in the chat if you want. How many? Hey, say William, how many hours? William, knows. William, William knows. you have your hand raised. How long okay. is a Martian day? Oh, no. Um, I wasn't doing it for that. I had another question. Okay. Um, how, how do you know um, if you can actually build houses on Mars? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about houses and habitats um next after the martian day so so janet's hand was up like a lot oh there we go um we've got an answer already in the chat so that is that is correct that is i mean we're talking about we're just averaging it right so i think that uh and the answer was one day plus 40 minutes um and so that's that's right so it's it's not 25 hours it's close to 25 hours um, we added, I don't remember now if it was 37 or 39 No, no, minutes. no, you did, you did the, the, the 40 minutes. I know because I was mission support. And if they did their Mars day, then their day would shift 40 minutes yep. every day for mission support. And okay. for the 37 days, it was 37 days that they stayed in okay. Martian time. I was the only Capcom willing to shift my day with them. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I know. So, okay, I wasn't because I wasn't sure if we rounded or not. But yeah, so that there we had a, our mission support team designed a custom clock. And it would help us basically every morning we had to wake up and change the time on our watches to this new time. And so we added 40 minutes every day. And we actually went around the world backwards in time zones. So we started on our time zone, which was um, either Atlantic or Eastern, I'm not quite sure. And then we made our way west like west coast of uh, North America, uh, over the ocean, Australia, and then around the world. So during the first week, so to, like Artemis mentioned, it took over a month of Earth month, like Earth days, um, to go around the entire planet, adding up these 40 minutes because it takes 24 hours of shifting, right? To get all the way back to zero again. Um, and we, it was pretty cool. The first week we felt like we were kind of jet lagged and we were hungry at the wrong times. But then after that, it actually felt kind of good. It felt like we were getting a sleep in. And the, the kind of ironic part is that we actually spent 20 minutes out of that 40 minutes doing extra research, extra human factors research on how this, how the extra time was affecting us, like reaction time testing, like how fast can you push the buttons and see the numbers changing. Um, so that's important, but it felt really good. And it was also right after I mentioned, uh, how we had kind of a stressful middle where there was like two EVAs a day. Well, the Martian time started um, overlapped with that and it actually helped us because it kind of like stretched the days out a little bit and gave us, it felt like a bit more of a cushion. And then we finished doing the two EVAs a day and we actually changed our priorities because we saw people were stressed and we had to change our schedule. So we're trying to help people adapt. Um, and so that's a huge part of all exploration. And even now is, you know, flexibility adaptability are two huge things. And so we were able to work. Do with, you kids all that. understand why it was possible to, to, oh, to pretend right. that it was, <laughs> you know, on Mars, they were in the Arctic. Summer has no real night. Otherwise it wouldn't yeah. have been possible. Yeah, so we put the windows, we, bar we boarded up the windows, shifted that 40 minutes every day. And so uh, by the middle of it, when you think about that, you're like, oh, that means, there were some days or not some days over uh, two weeks we're basically up in the middle of, of North America's night doing research and that was kind of eerie because the lighting was a little bit softer that the, the uh, angles of uh, shadows were different 
uh, that was actually a pretty cool sensation. Um, and so it was, uh, yeah, it was a really cool experiment and I'm glad we did it. So it's kind of when people ask me like how many days was your simulation, uh, that's where things get a little confusing because I say we had a hundred operating days, but that was 101 Earth days because we actually lost the whole Earth day by doing the Mars time. Yes. Wow, I love that. All right, so let's go to William's question about how do we know that we could build a house, a habitat? Uh, I think we've talked oh, right, a little right. bit about where those things might exist, but go ahead. Yeah, um, so we would definitely need to have some of the key um, structures with us. Uh, one idea is to use expandable modules, meaning that we just basically just add air, right? And then poof, they, they expand. Um, but then we could use the actual Martian regolith to help coat it and give it some radiation protection. So essentially we would still want to probably have uh, ways of creating our own structures because um, to retain that pressure, just like a spacesuit, you need the right layers. Um, you need to make sure that it's safe. So you can't just like kind of hope that, you know, it prints, uh, you know, 3D print the perfect layer. It's, it, that's the type of material that we would really want to have for exploration. So uh, more than likely we would have these, it would almost look like uh, if you took a module off the space station, um, it, I think the, the, the Martian is a great movie that way because it shows kind of a, an idea of what these um, structures might look like. Um, I think the, um, the dome that Mark Watney is growing all the potatoes in, uh, there's a scene where you know, it loses the structure in the air because there was a, a manufacturer defect, just the slightest defect, which they talk about in the book, but not in the movie. Um, and it causes it to rip and then it, the whole thing falls apart. So there are definitely things we need to bring from Earth um, in order to get things established uh, on Mars. And then we can use the Mar we can use resources on Mars to have them help us. So, you know, you could think of it as the exterior protection wall. So, you, you know, you could have a Martian brick wall, if you will, or Martian brick sand covering. Like you're going to the beach and you dump sand on your body to protect, it could actually protect you from the sun. Well, on Mars, it could protect you from the radiation as well. Uh, Janet, I do that to read questions and stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, what kind of challenges? Because it's like when we think about technology and that information transfer and, yeah. you know, 14 to 16 minutes to get something there. I mean, kind of like uh, Artemis's pressure cooker, right? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's not an instant delivery. You got to wait a while. So what do you see or maybe have some knowledge about the advance of a faster transfer of knowledge in that way. Yeah, so um, depending on what we actually need, um, you might want to actually establish uh, a reuse recycling uh, key component to a mission where you know that the packaging that's, just say it's holding your, your food, uh, we're not gonna get, food we could talk about forever when it comes to Mars mission, but you need to have food that's going to be able to be stable and safe uh, on a shelf, if you will, for two years. So that way it's ready to go. You just add water, hopefully you have water to add to it. Um, but the packaging could be used, could be just say melted down and put into a 3D printer. And so if there's um, a demand or a need for a tool, science equipment, um, you know, you would work with your support team to figure out a design, or maybe you would design it yourself uh, on Mars, like depending on you know, how much help you need. Uh, and then you would just print that thing and be able to use it right away to help you on your mission. So um, things that are more complicated, circuit boards and things that we, we're not really ready to 3D print, um, that you might want to have extra spares of. But other things that we might be able to manufacture um, from, the, like recycle, reuse things, that I think is an important part of missions. Muted, Janet. <laughs> uh, sorry, if there are uh, cracks in glass, could they mm -hmm. use? Could you use an epoxy resin on the Moon or Mars to fix it? Would microgravity have any different effect on some of those things? Or adhering in microgravity. Yeah, that's very very good question. And so yes. we'll, we'll let the future generation of explorers here 
uh, solve problems like that. But um, for the most part, you would you would, you know you can't call your auto glass repair person to come do it for you. You have to hope that you have the tools or a tool close enough that can be used to help you repair the window. Um, when I think about window cracks here on earth, I think about how like you want to melt the material and try to like get it to prevent the crack from spreading is the first problem. And then thinking about do you replace it or what do you do with it next is the next problem. So um, the resins themselves might be something that is more of materials that you have available than that you would actually take from the mineralogy of the moon or from Mars. Um, it doesn't mean you couldn't do it. Like there are lots of resources that are available in both locations, but more than likely when it comes to an extreme repair like that, you don't want to wait for something to be processed. You want to hope that you have the stuff right away to stop it. And we're going to end on a funny question. Okay. <laughs> how, how do you dispose of waste, both what you, yeah, you create in human <laughs> waste uh, in analog missions? Okay. Um, so, <laughs> <Big drum. laughs> hey, I, I, this is a, a science thinking community here, right? We're, we're not afraid to say the word feces, and we're definitely not afraid to say the word poop or pee, yep. Uh, yep. number one, two, whatever. That's, you know, it's funny. And it's also our, our daily lives, right? So we can't, you know, we, it's definitely okay to have jokes. Uh, I remember, I think I remember the first, you know, joke that my son laughed at when he was like two or whatever was of course a poop joke. So this, this is something we shouldn't be afraid of. So, but what we should be afraid about is having to poop in the Arctic. Um, so uh, not the easiest thing to do. Um, so for the Arctic specifically, uh, there's no plumbing. So you actually had to separate the two activities. Um, for the men, it was a little bit easier. Um, so the urine would have to go through a funnel uh, and it went into a drum where the fuel used to, like an old uh, fuel drum where the, um, excuse me, the fuel after it got used up from the generator, you could then use that empty drum to fill up with urine. And so we actually filled up the urine in those drums and we shipped them out on the Twin Otter resupply missions. So we removed them. So we didn't just leave like all our waste in the Arctic. Um, and then for the second part, a, a lot more harder to deal with feces. We actually had to use like a, basically a poop bag. Um, so you would sit on the bag, you know, you have to separate all of your activities. Um, I joke that it's like separating church and state. Um, and so your, your poop bags, would then end up in the trash. And there's not really, even uh, with our technology today, there's not a lot we can do um, for recycling feces. And a lot of people are like, oh, just use it to grow plants. And like, there's a lot of toxins in human feces and you can't really use it. And so um, there were a few different things we tried. We tried shipping it out. I think only once, there might've been one time where we were um, instructed to burn. Um, and I think that was a horrible idea because you're just releasing then the plastic bag that's holding that into the environment. And so we stopped that. We're like, this is, this is not right. You know, we're changing it. We're changing the protocol. Um, so we're looking out for the earth. And so we would have that removed and flown out. Um, so that was pretty important to keep the environment and keep the environment, you know, an actual scientific investigation area. Like you don't want it to just be, here's the habitat and then here's human waste mountain right next to it. So. Yeah, um, I, I have a little yeah. bit to add. There was yeah. a research done, not at the Flashline Mars Arctic Station, but at the Mars Desert Research Station near Hanksville, about, you know, E. coli bacteria. And they are in our poop, you know, E. coli. Yeah. And uh, we, we did a research for several months, actually, uh, because Dr. Penelope Boston wanted us to, to write down, you know, how far did we pollute with E. coli, so with our waste, although at the MDRS we did have, um, you know, a, a, a toilet and a better system and we didn't ship it out and it wasn't, you know, transported or anything, but still. And we found that even 100 meters from the habitat, there were still E. coli bacteria, which means that the fact that we humans, only six at a time, but we were there and we were, you know, doing pee and poop like humans do, and apparently we were 
polluting the environment. And this is important for research. I mean, it's, it's not something that you're very interested in probably around your own home, but if you're in doing research and you're supposed to have a pristine environment where you do not pollute your own bacteria into the environment because you're actually looking for local bacteria and you wouldn't want them to mix with your bacteria, then this is important. So it was important research and it, it shocked us that it was so bad because we had no idea. We thought, you know, we were pretty good, but apparently we weren't. Yeah, and a lot of the NDRS waste went into a septic tank, which we think ruptured as well. Um, and so the whole field next to the habitat was actually awesome. like basically um, uh, damaged goods, if you will, in that, yes. again, damaging the environment. And, you know, if you want to think about this and like, what if you guys were to say, living in the jungle or just say you're living in your Minecraft house and you have a bathroom and you're just tossing your waste, well, somebody's going to live downhill of you or that might go into your water supply and then you need that water supply or there's, you know, aquatic life living in the water supply. So there's a trickle down effect of everyone's waste. So it's something that as a planet, we have to be very uh, aware of. And so we have to know where is our waste going? Is it being handled properly? And so those are even for like in the US, these are major problems that we need to uh, do a better job of, um, I guess you can say closing the loop on our own life support system here on our spaceship Earth. Oh, well, I was gonna say, this is such a good question. Uh, Top of Swinney is having some ch uh, computer issues, but her question okay. is, does the abnormal sleep schedule affect an analog astronaut's mental health? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I can give a longer answer, but yes. Sleep is critical for everyone. Um, the, in general, not, in this, again, this is very general. A lot of the people involved with these longer analog missions are selected. They're not just um, a group that shows up. Our group actually was part of a big crew selection um, the people who go to high seas in Hawaii that usually some, some of them are shorter, but some of them have been up to a year in Hawaii, uh, go through kind of like a, almost their own uh, astronaut selection, which is based off of NASA guidelines. And so the people involved are, I guess you could say, a, a little bit more mental tough than the average public, but they're still human and they still go through different issues. And sleep is one of the most important things that we need to make sure we get enough of um, on these analogs. And just like, you know, here during our time in our, in our cozy, I guess, pandemic homes, um, we need to make sure that we're getting enough sleep so that we can function. And having two small kids, that's not always an option. Um, but that's something a lot of parents of young kids go through. And, and, and I've heard there's another side, you know, there's eventually I'll sleep properly, but that, it doesn't matter. We need to know how to cope and function with what we have available to us. And so, yeah, sleep is, the, the sleep and is, nutrition, yeah. If, if you don't sleep enough, and that goes for me and for all of you, then actually after a few nights, if you don't, you don't sleep shorter nights for whatever reason, you actually are as sluggish in your responses as if you are drunk, as if you had too much to alcohol to drink. So not sleeping enough is, you know, might sound like fun, especially if you're young and you can't, you know, determine when you want to go to bed because your parents still tell you, you know, go to bed and sleep enough. Yeah. Let me as an adult tell you that in the end, it is smarter to do that. Smarter for your schoolwork and everything. But just, you know, just imagine you have to do a school test and you haven't slept enough for the last two weeks because you had a party or what, the last two days for it because you had a party. And now you have to do the test. And if I tell you that you actually will be a bit, you know, not as smart, not like, you know, you will be actually doing the test as if you had drunk, you know, beer or wine you understand why your parents are right when they say you need enough sleep and why if you have sleeping problems, you have to look into it because it will actually affect your school tests. It will affect your learning. But if you are an adult and you have a job, it will, it, it, it will affect your job. And not just if you're an astronaut or, you know, if you, if you just have a job, it will affect you. So, you know, think about that and look into mm -hmm. it if ever in your life, you have a problem sleeping, you know, find a way to relax before you go to bed or whatever, because sleep, apparently we humans really need it. We're not a machine. 
And that's when your body does its most repairing of all kind of some Ooh. cellular function and stuff. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a moment in time where your body's repairing. So before Dr. Ryan maybe says his last little comments here, a couple of things. Tomorrow dun, 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 is design challenge. So get those 20 cool. pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one meter of string, one meter of uh, masking tape or some kind of tape and one large marshmallow. I'm gonna push back. I'm gonna create a big desk here. When I say go tomorrow, we will have exactly 22 minutes to see how high we can build. And you know, if you've been at my camp, I usually go, all right, all right, I'll give you three more minutes. And then it's like, and I would highly suggest if you've got a ruler or some kind of measuring device that, you know, and nobody, everybody's got to tell the truth, right? Because it could look different if on our screens or whatever. And we're going to build a space elevator that can hold that, um, you know, the weight of that marshmallow. So we will think about design strategies. We will talk about how triangles are the strongest thing. Hashim, I saw you. I know that you guys joined late. I'm so delighted that you guys come on after your prayers. Uh, but tomorrow is design challenge. And I tell you what, if you have to come on late tomorrow, we'll let you and some others kind of like, we'll probably do a little bit of review before we do that. But design challenge Wednesday. So it's going to be super fun. And I have prizes. Just saying, this chin always has some prizes. I find my way to have some prizes. Nice. So the prize, I got several of these. Uh, so, and I opened it up because I was hoping they weren't too cheeky. And uh, it's 10 in one experiment. So, uh, but your supplies are 20 pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one large marshmallow, one meter of string, preferably kind of like kite string. That's kind of good. Um, use what you have and uh, a meter of tape. Any last words for us, Dr. Ryan, as you close out this session with our kiddos today? Yeah, let's bring it back to the beginning. So, you know, happy uh, USA National Astronauts Day. Um, and so just kind of uh, one thing that kind of came to mind as we were chatting about sleep and everything else near the end here was that uh, as part of the astronaut selection this year, they asked us to uh, do some online testing, which included writing an essay and answering multiple choice questions and things like that. And so for that, I actually planned which day I was gonna take the test like three days before it, made a plan with my whole family and was like, okay, this is the, this Saturday is gonna be the day. So I'm gonna get up, you know, we're gonna have breakfast, do whatever, I'm gonna have some coffee because caffeine helps a bit because it wakes you up when you're, when you're a bit sluggish. Um, and, um, and then I kind of had my window where the family was gonna be out of the house for a few hours um, so I could focus and have enough sleep. So uh, that's important. And one thing that actually comes to mind, which I think is might connect here with people is that um, a lot of, of these like new space companies like SpaceX and other companies, one of the big thing they ask people, they don't ask you, you know, they wanna see what your grades are like and you know, how you perform in school and other activities. But one thing they, that they like to ask is, what are you building in your garage? Um, they want to know what other activities you're busy doing. And so I thought about that because on my desk, I don't, well, I mean, I have a garage, but I haven't I've been too busy to build anything, is that on some telecons, I sometimes I like to like keep my hands busy so I'm not surfing the web while I'm trying to listen. So this is kind of like not what I'm building in my garage, but, oh, I got to turn off my... Uh, screen my fun screen thing here my virtual background mm -hmm. just because otherwise this will look even weirder mm -hmm. um there we go so that's what i'm working on while i listen uh yeah oh, it's a little metal awesome. yeah metal millennium falcon so uh you know nice little challenge of extremely small parts ridiculously small parts but anyway think about that like what are you guys building be cool to find out um besides minecraft minecraft is pretty cool um but it's also good to get like some actual, you know, physically touched projects. These would be great, by the way, to send to Mars because you wouldn't even need to have um, it ready to go. You could actually get instructions and then your like 3D printer or your, um, uh, you know, whatever tool would just, you know, put the pattern into the metal, little sheet metal, and then you'd have a whole new activity to figure out. Um, so those are the kind of creative games and things that we need to think about for astronauts to help them on their journeys. 
All right. We are so grateful for you. I let's see. I saw a question here, and it's like you. I don't know if it's for tomorrow. Let me see. Let me go back over here to chat. Come back up here. It was a few questions ago. Who okay. had a question? Let's see. Uh, Ian, what was your question? And I don't know if I see you. So uh, yeah. So Ian, what was your question? Uh, oh, it's about the challenge tomorrow. Yes. How so, big should the marshmallow? Oh, so so How a large marshmallow. If you don't have a large marshmallow, you can use maybe something like um, hmm, like maybe a little cotton, a puff of cotton, cotton. or cotton. Uh, or maybe even you could take like a piece of paper. I don't have one right now close to me. A piece of paper and kind of scrunch it up. But we want it again. It's not going to weigh very much, but it's like. I would say like an inch and a half, two inches like a thick there, you know, like a little thick marshmallow. And again, it's whatever kind of string, nobody needs to go out and buy anything. Masking tape, it's that kind of yellow brown looking tape. It g gives you a little more flexibility. Duct tape is going, might you might think it's strong, but it's like, that's gonna be, again, when we start thinking about building materials, will that break my very like little structural things I'm trying to get high, as high as possible. The goal of it is, is to build the highest one possible that supports that weight of a marshmallow. The only rule is you can't skewer the marshmallow, but we're gonna try this online. Lucas, I see your hand, baby. Last one, and then we're gonna go for the day. What's your question, Lucas? Um, actually, I have two things, and um, um, one's don't forget my birthday. Um, I would birthday. not forget your birthday, baby, baby. Cannot um, and then that. I got a question. Sure. How many people would you give 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 a prize to? Well, let me count them up. One, two, three, four. I've got five wow. of these. Okay. So. Okay. Bring your best building. All right. So guys, let your mind revolve around this thought. The universe let's, is always expanding. Let your mind do the same. And that's the view from Janet's planet. Bye, guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. You're a dear bye. friend. Thanks, I everyone. appreciate it very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye, Mr. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.